Coming up on Theatre Talk. The single most important thing you can have is good taste. Mm. That's crap. <laughs> Don't do it. This is very good. Keep that. Mm. Whereas somebody who is a, a novice or inexperienced would say, oh, well, we, we, we did the, 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 the dancing version. Now let's imagine that we're doing it on ice. <laughs> so, you know. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. So, Michael, we have one of our favorite guests back with us tonight. Absolutely. And one of my oldest friends in New York. When I was a uh, young uh, reporter at Theater Week magazine, I had the great good fortune to meet one of my idols, John Simon, who was then the uh, drama critic for New York magazine. He is now the drama critic for the Westchester Guardian, and he has a very fine uh, uh, blog, John, uh, called um, uh, John Simon Uncensored. Well, actually, the, the blog is called Uncensored John Simon. Uncensored. Now, John, how many years um, have you been a theater critic? What are we going on now? Oh, God. 60? Oh, I mean, I can remember things that almost no living being <laughs> can remember. Yeah. Can you remember the very first review you ever wrote? Oh, the very first. Well, you see, when I was at Harvard, which I was forever, um, there was a little sheet called The Audience for which... Uh, I used to write, but you know, I think the very first may have been for the um, uh, for the uh, Harvard Literary Magazine, The Advocate, um, in which I reviewed Tennessee Williams's The st Streetcar Named Desire. That would have been around 1948. Whenever, and it was a total rave review, huh. and I was fired because no play could be that good. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm the only person who was fired for loving streetcar street car named, named desire. desire. Did you not meet Tennessee Williams after you wrote that good, yeah, good review? Yeah, yes, yes. Wow. You see what happened is at that time he gave a sort of a talk at Harvard. He said he didn't give talks, but he answers questions. And one of the questions was, what do you think about existentialism, Mr. Williams, which was then the fashion. And he said in that wonderful, charming southern accent of his, I don't know anything about existentialism. Maybe one of you could tell us. So, uh -oh. I, ra <laughs> so I raised my arm and told him what. He says, well, if it is that, I was an existentialist when I was 10 years old. <laughs> what did you say to him? What was your answer when oh, you were God, that? It was, a, it was at least two paragraphs <laughs> of Edward Albee, you know, a real, par real paragraph. Um, and um, then he invited me to uh, have lunch with him at the Ritz. Whether it was for my brains or for my good looks, I don't know. <laughs> so I came, and he was opens the door, and he's wearing pajamas and a loosely uh, unbuttoned uh, dressing gown, robe. <laughs> and I said, oh, my God, I better watch out. <laughs> You're going to so be Blanche Dubois. <laughs> so we sat down to eat, and he was very forthcoming. And I said, I have to keep talking about women. That's my only protection. <laughs> And I did, um, but it was, it was Armistice Day, as it was called in those days, and there were all these tanks lined up outside the Ritz, ready for the Armistice Day parade. And Tennessee looked out and said, he said, these poor devils, they must be cold as a witch's tit. <laughs> I said, a platitude from a great man. <laughs> um, then he starts talking, and he says, you know, Greta Garbo was the greatest. She seemed to be walking on air. Another platitude. It was one of the great disappointments of my life. Okay. Just to stick with Tennessee Williams for a while, because you saw him at, the, at his height, though, of, of writing the great plays, and then you would have covered, really, his devolution, if yes. you will. I mean, the plays got worse after a certain period. It was not only a devolution, it was a deep volution. <laughs> yes. What do, you think, what do you think happened to him? What happens to a talent Well, you like know... That? Nobody is, has to be as good when he is getting old and tired and has sort of said what was really close to his heart, what was really important in his life. He just, he wrote himself out. Some people like, like Bernard Shaw can go on and on and on. Yeah. 
but other people, you know, peter out. And um, we can't hold it against them. As long as they've made their contribution, which he most certainly has, let them peter out. It's just that one then has to review them unfavorably. Again and again. And the last time I saw him, I was sitting at Elaine's at the next table to his. But he didn't recognize me, because that was much later. And so at one point he turned to me and he said, what time is it? And I was sorely tempted to say, it's later than you think. <laughs> oh, <John. laughs> but, but for once I held, I bit my tongue and said 9.30 or whatever it was. Now, you were an academic, a PhD in comparative literature mm -hmm, at that's Harvard. Right. When did you decide to become um, not an academic critic, but a, uh, a, a popular critic? Well, I tried to be both because for many, many years I was writing drama criticism for the Hudson Review. Right, which I was could, a literary magazine. Yeah, where I could be as academic as I wanted to. And then I had New York Magazine at the same time where I could be popular. And I managed to do both. Mm -hmm. as, as certain opera singers try to sing pop songs. But and, and you were notorious as well. I mean, you're, you're a critic that, uh, that was very well known, you are very well known, and you were also very well known for saying outrageous things which offended well, people. Well, yes, but I meant them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you enjoy, though, the kind of, Susan calls it notoriety, I would call it sort of attention, that you began to get uh, at a place like New York Magazine, and uh, did that kind of fuel the, the critic's ego in some way? Did you like being talked about? And, yeah, sure, yeah. sure. I mean, I, I enjoyed both. I liked, I liked being read in academe, and I liked being read by Hoi Polloi. <laughs> uh, it was fine yes. either way. Did you shift your writing styles between the two? Not consciously, but, but maybe unconsciously. Well, of course, in the Hudson Review, I could throw in Latin quotes. <laughs> in New York Magazine, I could not. You there could. was that much difference, but not an awful lot. Right. Not an awful lot. Did you ever feel, though, um, when you were writing for New York Magazine, for more popular magazines, that you were ever wasting your skills on so much dreck that Broadway had to offer? Did you well, say, what am I doing with what well, I've learned? That's what Bob Brewstein said in his reviews of some of my books. He would always say that I can write good, serious criticism, but at New York Magazine, they have polluted me, they have corrupted me, and, <laughs> and I play to the masses and so on, uh, which isn't true, uh, but it pleased Bob Brewstein to think so. Mm. So you never felt that? You never felt I'm wasting no. my time sitting through? No, because if you look at my books, my col various collections of criticism, you'll find that if you really look into it, you'll find that some reviews are from the Hudson Review, but a great many more are from New York, and some are from uh, Bloomberg, where I was afterwards at Bloomberg News. Mm -hmm. So there are reviews from everywhere, and they all blend in. Mm -hmm. Now, who were the... Um, the critics that you read growing up uh, that would have influenced you? Were you influenced by people like uh, Brooks Atkinson or oh, Walter? No, apparently not. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. Brooks Atkinson George. was a nice man, but yeah. that's as far as it goes. George G. Nathan? Did Nathan, to some extent, yes. Uh, Dwight MacDonald, probably more than anybody oh, else. Yeah. And Edmund Wilson. Mm. Uh, Why Dwight MacDonald? Well, because he's good. Uh, he, he was witty, he was charming. He. He wrote about movies quite a bit. He didn't write much about theater, but it comes to the same thing, which I was also a film critic. Sure. And we became friends. He wrote the introduction to my first book, mm -hmm. uh, which people have rightly criticized. It was a critical introduction. He didn't just say good things about me. He said some not so good things, which but is But that's not, okay. Right? That's a, it's okay. Well, okay by me. But some people thought it was in bad taste. <laughs> right. No, he was charming, and I loved him uh, dearly. And, and the only sadness in our relationship was that when he was very ill on, on the verge of dying in hospital, I called him on the phone, and he yelled at me. I was trying to sleep. How dare you wake me up from my sleep? <laughs> oh, no. So here I, I raised the dying. <laughs> um, it, it made me feel so. There was a critic that I, uh, uh, I didn't know him, of course, but I read him who I thought was quite good, Stark Young. Did you read He was him? good. Yeah, Southern critic. Southern oh, yeah, but he transcended his Southern. <laughs> yes. um, then, of course, there was always your old friend Eric Bentley. Yes, too. wonderful critic. Yeah, still I, with us, Eric, in 96, 97. Yeah, I, yeah I, liked, I liked his stuff, too, but I didn't read quite as much of him as I might have. 
But I've had various other people, too. Mm. Um, I, I love criticism, even if it completely disagrees with mine. I find it interesting. As long is, as it's which well. Which is why I read the Times critics, for example. <laughs> right. Well, you said some nice things about them. You had an interesting um, post recently on your website yeah. about. Oh, um, well, I think they're good stylists. Charles Isherwood yeah, and Ben Brandt. Yeah, I don't know about the others. Some of the others are very good, too, but one isn't as aware of them. So they may even be better. But um, those two can write. They can write exceedingly well. I remember a dinner at a very fancy restaurant with Elaine May and uh, Stanley Donan, and her boyfriend. We were having a very fancy dinner at a very fancy restaurant, and they started attacking Ben Brantley in the worst way. Hmm. I said, look, you can disagree with his taste. I do too most of the time. But you cannot agree with the fact that the man knows how to write. But they wouldn't conceive, and I and I, I can argue fairly well, but I couldn't budge them. <laughs> but you disagree with sometimes with the taste that. Oh, the Bradley taste. Yes, we Charles see. Did. I said in this piece in my blog that there are three things you need as a critic: you need to be able to think, you need to be have have good taste, mm -hmm. and you need to have a good style. Right. And you need all three of them. Just one or two won't do. <laughs> and these guys have terrific style, but their taste is very bizarre. <laughs> And thinking, come see, come sa. Well, not always, but boy, is Ben Brantley getting, taking it on the chin. Is that the expression right now? Yes, we, both you. Well, uh, Alec, Alec, Alec Baldwin, Baldwin went out and, and, and smacked Ben Brantley around recently on the Huffington Post. Oh, but oh. not physically, I hope. No, <laughs> no well, he's capable of it, but he no doubt. He ranted test. after him for not <laughs> liking his play. Which but, you know, but you've never had a problem, though, with people who have attacked you, right? I mean, well, you've um, you know, uh, got to go back and forth with it. Well, what's her name? Uh, the, the dreadful creature, the blonde. Sylvia Miles. Yeah, Sylvia Miles. <laughs> I've happily almost forgotten her name, and I've certainly forgotten the, the uh, food stuff that she threw at my most expensive California Rodeo Drive jacket that I'd only worn twice before. <laughs> well, she's a very expressive actress. She jumped a plate of pasta on your head. She had this plate of, um, of not cold cuts, um, What's that raw steak that I'm trying oh, to Oh, steak tartare. Steak tartare. She threw it at my beautiful rodeo drive jacket. And I said I would charge it to her to have it clean. And she said, well, you probably don't have it very often anyway. <laughs> very funny. Uh, we, we just have a few minutes left talking with you, John. You were, are you, uh, how shall I put this delicately? Are you, will you ever retire? Will you ever stop writing criticism? Well, I think if I have to write with putting my feet forward, <laughs> uh, I might stop. <laughs> but I intend to go on as long as I possibly can. I feel totally rejuvenated each time I write a review, hmm. even if it's a favorable one. <laughs> but you just, you're, you're, you're a writer at heart. That's yes, what you yeah. love to do. And I write other things, too. I do book reviews yeah. for various publications. I've written about music in various places. And I have books to testify to all of these. I also know you've written some beautiful poetry over the years. Were you ever yes. tempted to write a novel or a play yourself? Mm, not so much. Why? Uh, not so much. But uh, I'm sorry to use this phrase, not so much. It's much too popular these days. Uh, <laughs> Platitudes. <laughs> yeah. but, um, but yes, poetry I still occasionally do. Mm -hmm. And I always write birthday poems to my wife. <laughs> and I used to write birthday poems to Yoko Ono, too. Uh, speaking of birthdays, John, um, uh, you just celebrated your, uh, what birthday is it? 88th. 88th birthday. So Susan and I didn't compose a poem, so you may have no. to settle for uh, uh, a little surprise for you. Do we have, uh, do we have a little uh, John Simon? Oh, okay. Happy birthday to you. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday John. You. Oh, my Happy birthday, goodness. John Simon. Those are from Barbara Streisand and Liza Minnelli, and, Liza Minnelli. <laughs> and Michael Feingold, three of your favorites. Well, look, I'm, I'm one year old. <laughs> It must be my second child. <laughs> That's right. Well, as Tennessee Williams might say, blow out your candles, Laura, or your candle, Laura. <laughs> my, well, my wife has uh, warned me not to be a blowhard. <laughs> so I probably won't. <laughs> All right, well, we'll just... <laughs> we'll be like that. We'll let it burn. Bur we'll let it continue to burn. All right. And before we let you go, John, uh, in all of the nights you've been in the theater, is there any one particular performance play moment that um, <laughs> before you pass into another world you will 
will flash through your head again? Anything that oh, you saw that none well, of us may you know, remember anymore? It's like asking a mother which is your favorite child, and she has 12 children, mm. and she loves at least 11 of them. <laughs> right. um, so uh, I, I, there are too many. But most recently, the thing that moved me most was Cicely Tyson in A Trip to Bountiful. A superb performance, mm. and from someone as old as I am. Yeah, that was a wonderful, memorable, memorable performance. Yeah, but there have been many others, too. Yeah, yeah. Anything I, from the past, though, that you might be the only person around who remembers? Oh, God, yes, but then you'd have another half-hour program, and we'll do that. We'll do You that. didn't see Lorette Taylor in... Um, uh, I did, actually. You saw Lorette Taylor yeah. in Yeah, in, uh, I'm, that, I'm, that, I'm that ancient. I mean, you know... Was that a legendary one, Lorette Taylor? Yeah, that was legendary. But, you know, the sad thing is, I know I liked it, but I can't remember it. I would give anything to be able to summon it up clearly in my memory, but I can't. Well, you'll have to make do with C Cicely Tyson, which is not, yeah. not, not a bad that. one. No, there are others, too. There are quite a few others. Yeah. Well, well, happy 88th birthday, John Simon, whom you can read in the Westchester Guardian. And on uh, two, the blog is Uncensored John Simon. Yeah, and the website is John Simon Uncensored. And your books are all, most of them are still in print, too, I think. Are they? Yeah, well, quite a few of them are. Collections of music criticism, film yeah, criticism, yeah. drama criticism. And besides, they're antiquarians, too. <laughs> like me. <laughs> All right, John Simon, thanks for being our guest on Theater Talk and um, many more birthdays. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Sir, you believe in God. Believe also in me. Forget Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, why do you all want to go there? Old sir, tried and tested. No, it's because other boys want to go there. It's the hot ticket, standing room only. So I'll thank you if no one mentions <laughs> Oxford or Cambridge in my lessons. <laughs> 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 there is a world elsewhere. Uh, you're hitting us again, sir. Child, I am your teacher. <laughs> one of our favorite actors, Richard Griffiths, died recently. Um, he was also one of our favorite guests here. On oh, Peter he was Talk. terrific. Yeah. yeah, we had him on a couple of times when he was uh, in the History Boys, for which he won the Tony Award on Broadway. That's right. And also we had him with Daniel Radcliffe when he was in town doing Equus. Uh, he was a charming man and a fine actor, and we want to remember Richard tonight. Let me ask you, you as Richard Griffiths, the actor, surrounded by all these young actors, some of them on the cusps of, you know, what I think are going to be great careers. I agree, I agree. What are, are you teaching them any sort of tricks of the trade, and are they paying attention to you, or are they just laughing at you the way they laugh at Hector? Uh, the, the, not the last thing. I think they are watching me in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I do have a consciousness of trying to teach them things without lecturing. Mm -hmm. So I, I've never, I never lecture people. I never t say you should do this. I will occasionally offer suggestions in a very nervous uh, way um, because I really don't want to tread on anybody's feelings of personal respect. You know, I don't want to suggest anybody's doing anything wrong or bad or anything. But I haven't. It's been two years, mm -hmm. and and the boys are now so far along the line from where they were two years ago. I'm, I'm not sure if the, any of them realize it. I think what they've learned is, certainly from me, is that nothing is set in stone. Absolutely nothing. I remember doing a show years ago with some opera singers. It was a, a play about Verdi, the, the, the composer. And what diced the nerves of the opera singers was that we would change the actors. Would, the scenes would be different every night. Mm -hmm. Or somebody, you know, that chair in this theater, is, we were touring, and um, we'd have to ad uh, um, completely adapt, move some Oh, opera singers don't go for that. And they couldn't no. deal with it. They kept, how can, you, how can you begin to remember all the stuff you're supposed to do and change the moves and change what you say mm -hmm. and change the way you say it? And I said, well, that's what we do. That's, that's what's normal, to keep it, the thing moving and, and transforming all the time. And, and they couldn't handle that at all because, uh, as I suspect with musicals, uh, the reason musicals can last longer than straight plays in, in, in a long run is that the musical is held together by the music. Mm. You, you know, there's a bright golden, yeah, he's on the metal. You have to hit that note at that moment because the, the band is there and they're driving that along. Right. And all of that imposes a discipline, which you don't get with theatre at all, with, um, with, with the play. And so the thing about the play that we've uh, had to show the boys is that, uh, it, it, is that it's, 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 it's about trying to reinvent uh, the situation, the scene, every single time you do it. But without, I mean, isn't there the danger, though, with the young actors, though, that they're reinventing a little... Mm -hmm 
too much, having a little too oh, fun. Yeah. They get a little too loose because they know it well and they're young and they're boisterous and they can fool around a little that's bit. That's very good, isn't it? That's exactly right. I mean, that's that's <laughs> what that's the, no, but that's true because it, you have to learn the difference between what works and what doesn't. Uh, the, the single most important thing you can have is good taste. Mm. That's crap. <laughs> Don't do it. This is very good. Keep that. Mm. This is terrible. That's so boring. Let's get rid of all of that. Oh, this is interesting. Mm. Let's put that there and hang on to that. Now we've got those two. Let's look for another quality. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. that, that, to me, that's the exercise of good taste. Mm -hmm. Whereas somebody who is a, a novice or inexperienced would say, oh, well, we, we, we did the, 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 the dancing version. Now let's imagine that we're doing it on ice. <laughs> and you say, well, yeah, OK, wait a minute. When you did the dancing version, was there any bit of it, any slice of it, any sliver of it that you thought was fabulous? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, there was a bit when we did that. I said, all right, just keep that. <laughs> Let's forget the rest. Let's not go to the skating rink now. <laughs> that's why you that's acting. To, you see, that's the difference, yeah. And that's what those boys have got to be learning from someone such as yourself. You see, it's what the Stanislavski thing was all about. I mean, when people talk to students about acting, they say, I, I find it very difficult sometimes because the thing about Stanislavski was he was a furrier. A furrier, uh, yeah. A furrier who was nuts about the theatre. I mean nuts about the theatre. And uh, he, he, he asked himself the question, why is it that you get uh, 100 actors, right, and, and 97 of them have been on, and off, uh, on the stage and off it in the past hour and you've been watching, and you're still sitting like this in that chair thinking, I, w I wish my backside was more comfortable, you know, <laughs> uh, he said carefully. And, uh, uh, and then another person walks on and everybody goes, oh. The pain so now, goes why away. Why does that happen? Why does that happen? And what it is, is that the, 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 and, and for him, it was star quality. Mm -hmm. That was star quality. Somebody walks on, you're in, they haven't said anything yet, you're, you're already interested, yeah. something's going on. And his whole method, the Stanislavskian system, was aimed uh, at, at reproducing that. What is it the stars do, or people with star quality do mm -hmm. that you can replicate, do you see? So it's not even the same creature, but it looks like the same creature. Mm. Because his whole system was aimed at getting perfectly ordinary, people. boring actors, to people, be, yeah. to, to have acting power. That's I'm, a tough call, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I've been doing this 36 years for money now. <laughs> <laughs> or they've been paying you that long. Huh? You know, and, a perfectly uh, ordinary person such as yourself. A perfectly ordinary person such as myself. Is a Broadway star. Right, right. Uh, but well, what it's about, yeah, right. the whole focus of that, is that to me it's about what I would describe as a cascade of detail. Mm. And to get very similar I mean, what I've discovered just doing this play, I've made lots of discoveries, you know. For all I've been doing it over 30 years, I've, I mean, on the first night uh, that we opened, I had a new idea about one scene. I can't tell you how exciting that is after two and a bit years. Doing it, yeah. To have a new, I mean, a detail, which I did. And the boys all kind of responded in that sort of way of what, what's going on here, which of course transmitted to the audience. Is this when you put it on ice? Yeah, <laughs> you put the scene on it. Like that. You do, when you do the new thing with it, and they pick up on it. Yeah. What they don't get is that it, the frisson of interest that they have of What's this? Because mm. they've spotted the new thing yeah, yeah, yeah. about which the audience have no idea. Uh, when they do that, the audience pick up on that. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and w w what they haven't got right yet is that that, w that which they did was real. Mm. And that's why the audience get The audience have got this, this, this radar that spots the, the, the phony from the, 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 the less phony. Yeah, because <laughs> um, it's all phony, it's ultimately. A, ultimately, it's all phony. <laughs> You've got to suspend your disbelief. Now, I think that's one of the biggest things the boys have learned. Mm. But that what's marvelous is, that the <clears throat> is to behold their confidence now. Mm. I mean, they always were bumptious and confident and really intimidating. Alan Bennett came in every day to rehearsals and would end up on the floor, which is terrible because, you know, during rehearsals he had his 70th birthday. Most 70-year-olds, when they're curled up on the floor in a fetal position, you, 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 call, you call the A&E &E, <laughs> or something like that. But in his case, it was because of hysterics. Because he was laughing at the boys. Just laughing. So he would slip off his chair and, and just lie down on the floor and just lie with tears rolling down his face and say, 
oh, oh, this is much better than what I wrote. Why don't you just do that? You know. <laughs> Shut up, Alan. We're going to go pick him up and put him on this. No, <laughs> this was wrong, wasn't it? He said, I don't care. I said, no, yeah, well, we do. <laughs> you know, and it was, it was fun. But now, you see, they've got all the confidence yeah, yeah, that goes yeah, with yeah. that. Well, listen, um, uh, they've got the confidence because they've been watching a really great actor on oh. the stage in this play. It's been a pleasure talking with you tonight. Oh, well, I'm astonished. Is that, uh, That's it. It's over with. <laughs> this is ridiculous. I haven't even talked about anything Part yet. two. We, we did this, this lovely thing we did for little kids. Oh, little yeah. Kids like this. We can try and do this together we'll if you we want. Do this, all right. Okay. We'll just do a, we'll do a tempo like that. <laughs> Only they mustn't hear it because sound will cut their throats if they hear this. So we'll, we will do the, the timing, you see, and the cameras will see the timing, but they won't hear it. Right. Okay. Here we go. There, there was, was a man, and he was, was an insight. No, 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 what? we're in different keys. Oh, wait, okay. Mm, mm, the, uh, that's it. There was, was a man, and he was an encyclopedia. He knew the weight of the moon to announce and the name of every star. He knew all about etymology, Hebrew, Hebrew, Jujuology, syntax, syntax, hobnail, boot tax. He was full as a Pickford van. <laughs> <laughs> Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Corey and Bob Donnelly Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night.